Visualisation during treatment enabled me, in my mind, to amplify effects and minimise the negative consequences, the positive effects and minimise the negative consequences. And some people will say, well, poppycock, that's, that doesn't stack up anywhere. Well, as I say, um, in terms of my presentation, which I imagine will go on the website, I do have um, some uh, um, um, uh, research which, which I've cited for those who will be interested in having a look through and actually doing their own research and doing their own checking. Uh, but believe you me, um, positive intent, positive expectations, etc., have a positive potentially have a, a positive outcome. I use positive affirmations and positive language. Now, again, you know these can be thrown into the uh, into the into the mire of what they consider, you know, new age thinking or uh, flower power thinking and, and all sorts of things, and be poo pooed and rubbish. Well. Actually, these days, in terms of positive psychology, um, which is becoming more and more of a science, these sort of things are being ratified. Um, and using positive affirmations and positive language, I'll give you a couple of examples in a second, reinforce my hope, optimism, sense of control, maybe I should have said there, um, power and invulnerability. Now, I was never invulnerable, but I had the sense that I was invulnerable. I had the sense that I could cope with anything, and I had the sense with, bring it on, doctor, whatever you got, just bring it on. You know, no problem. Positive language examples um, over the alternative. Um, some people might say when they get to a particular situation, life is hopeless. That's it. You know, well, we change that to, um, you know, uh, I'm taking it one day at a time or whatever. Some other, some positive spin on what, you, what you're seeing. Um, avoidance of all or nothing thinking. Um, nothing can be done to help me. Whoa, you know, that's quite final, isn't it? Except you can replace that with, um, I may not be able to be cured, but I plan to live long and well. And that's kind of what I've said for myself. So mood, hope, and optimism elevate a catalyst. Laughter. Laughter is one of my favourite things. And it can be induced, and it is powerful. And those of you who read my book. It sounds like I'm trying to sell you, but you know, Roche, thanks to Roche, it's a free resource for you to have a look at and take or leave as you like. But laughter is the best medicine, and I found that laughter lifted me, steeled me before procedures. If I was going into an operation, actually, I often ended up with a sort of a comedian on my shoulder. I don't know how that happened. I have no idea what that was, but as I was being ro rolled forward in the trolley and my paper underwear and all the rest of it, all the things that could actually make you feel pretty bad about yourself, um, or self-conscious, um, I would start laughing to myself. Not, not, not too much outwardly, otherwise they might have, have rolled me to a different ward. But within myself, I started, I don't know, there was, there was something humorous coming to me and I felt, you know, I felt uplifted by the time I got into those, those places. It also helped me reduce nausea and pain. There is lots of research that talks about these sorts of interventions um, helping you with, uh, cope with symptoms from the treatments. I decided to find humour in the all too common platitudes. This is one thing I did. I did other things, as, 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 you, as some people will know, um, heard in the cancer arena. They could otherwise leave me feeling vulnerable, angry, and or demoralised. At any one stage in the hospital, in, some, in certain environments, you might hear some of this. You're so lucky you caught it. Don't worry, if this doesn't fix it, fix it nothing will. I had that one. I had that one at a time when it wasn't fixing it. I knew that the lumps were not responding to this chemotherapy. He, the doctor meant no harm whatsoever, but didn't think about what he was saying. This happened for a reason. Yeah, to create a lot of has hassle in my life. Um, this happened because God knew you could handle it. Um, look, uh, if, that's, if that's your belief, you have a faith, well, that's fine. Um, but if you don't, you know, if you're like me, um, you know, I, I'm not going to gain anything. I'm not going to benefit from that. And cancer is a gift. That's the classic, isn't it? That's the, that's the all-catch, all-catching classic. I leaned heavily on a love of my life, which was music. Music for me and laughter are the two cornerstones of my ability to be able to lift myself in difficult situations, to raise myself through depression, and to get myself at times through situations where I don't think I would have gotten through. Uh, you know, where I hear music, I feel no danger. And this is from you know, many years ago, um, but it's a, it's a fact. It opened me up also to the feelings that, that I had and I needed to express. So I talked to you before about the fact that, you know, I'm as expressive as, as the, brick, the brick that I referred to, uh, or was, um, and 
Uh, I found that listening to certain types of music behind my screens in privacy, I was able to actually let go of some of the emotions. And that freed me up to be able to <clears throat> shake myself up, take stock, and start again, making better decisions, focusing forwards, communicating better with the doctors, etc., etc. It is tensions and built for my fighting spirit. It's a cliche, fighting spirit, but it's a, it's a real one. You know, how, how ready are we to actually growl in the face of cancer or the treatments? You know, to me, that's, that's kind of the fighting spirit. I practice various approaches to expressive writing, and many of you will have heard of expressive writing uh, in different guises, you know, diarying, et cetera, your experiences and whatnot. You know, expressive writing in a whole bunch of guises has been found to elevate immune system in people affected by cancer. It hasn't necessarily yet been found to actually overturn the cancer, but it has shown positive results in terms of elevating immunity. Um, and what doing that did was enable me to explore, express, and release the negative emotions I talked about, amplifying my positive emotions, you know, once I got out of the negativity. Uh, and that cycle, by the way, by the way, I should say this, the cycle is important to occur. What we don't want to do is try and block out negativity and all those sorts of things, because those are natural human experiences. So it's natural, we're going to experience it. So if we deny it and say, well, that's, that's not the, oh, actually feeling great, we're kidding ourselves very often. So what we need to do through these sort of measures is actually pick ourselves up and take ourselves up through the negativity into the positive realm. So it enabled me to do a whole bunch of things. Social support and connectedness is something that's talked about a lot. I participated in various support groups online and live. And uh, you know, again, in the early days, and for at least a decade, I avoided them like the plague. Many GPs said to me, you know, I've got a support group, would you like to go along? But no way. I did not. I always sort of imagined them in my mind to be sort of cry on the show to tea parties, you know. And I was not in the mood. Uh, I was angry at cancer. I've often been angry at cancer. I was not in the mood to go along and listen to people cry on each other's shoulders or whatever. Of course, the reality when you actually get to these is that they're not like that, or 99% are not like that. And what you do, of course, is you pick a facilitated support group, which has a good facilitator who's going to make sure no one dominates the conversations, no one focuses on negativity, because some people do want to tell you all about their dire situations again and again and again. Um, but for the most part, uh, when, we join, when we get together with people affected by cancer, they are just strong, they are just sharing, and for me, it just humbled me in terms of what I found there. Um, helped me form, uh, further normalise my cancer experience. I said early on that you know, it took me a long time before I actually spoke to somebody who was affected with what I was. And it was like, it was like, um, it, it was like sort of talking to somebody, we were the only two in the world when we actually had a conversation. I just bumped into somebody in the ward. And, you know, we could relate to so many things that people around us weren't relating to. It was incredible. But, you know, support groups are an opportunity to, to do that. I learned from other people's coping methods because everyone copes differently. I'm very much, as you might get um, the feeling, I'm very much a bullet gate, um, you know, straightforward, uh, motivated, passionate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I apply all those things. And sometimes it's difficult for me to see there are other ways to actually achieve uh, resilience, there's other ways to achieve coping, there's other ways to achieve a whole bunch of things and to be able to see other people and what they do has enabled me to go okay, alright, well I think I'll still do this but actually that softer, more subtle approach around the agency, I love that, that that's, that's great. Um, I was inspired by others' strength and resilience and I've talked about that and I uh, accessed support organisations offerings so again, um, really that was something that I had not done but what I found was, you know, even if I went in there sneakily and just kind of crept around the library and, you know, didn't talk to anyone, um, I, would, I would sort of be able to, you know, pull some information out which I would take home and read and find very useful. I was able subtly, you know, not wanting to, but actually wanting to, to strike up a conversation with somebody in there about what they do and what they offer and those other things, you know. Um, so I found it extraordinarily valuable. And I attended various courses and learned more and more. Again, uh, the sort of courses, they might have been, like I attended a writing course uh, through a New Zealand writer who was affected by cancer herself. And it's not just the writing. It was a, it was a support forum to also help you um, talk about writing, you know, to, to uh, benefit from writing and the many different forms you could actually approach. 
And, you know, ultimately I became involved in giving back. Well, about 20 years ago I started kind of, you know, being available for people who wanted to be mentored one-to-one, uh, -one, just for odd conversations and things like that. My friends would refer to me, you know, going way back. And along the way, I got more and more involved in so-called giving back. But I found, you know, by, rather than, you know, a, an entirely selfless uh, sort of thing to do, I found I gained a heck of a lot from it myself. You know, I actually, I, I say there that it was, you know, engaging with other people, talking to uh, many of you people today is cathartic for me, you know? Because nobody out there that I, in my workplace, in my family, has always been affected by cancer and can talk to me about the things that we know about that, that they don't. So here's, a, here's one I don't think is in my book. So I stretched boundaries and tested my comfort zones time and again, and I still do this. Only to the extent, I like this one, only to the extent that we expose ourselves over and over to annihilation can that which is indestructible in us be found. I love that. Tested by fire and all that, you know, all the sort of things that we know about. So what did I do? I did a whole bunch of things, and these are some of them. I, de I worked to desensitize myself to the pain and discomfort of the procedures and treatments to the extent possible. And, you know, you might ask, well, what is that? What does that mean? Well, most of the time it was a mental response. It was a mental tuning out, you know, distraction, a um, whole bunch of things. But distraction was a big one. i just tune out to the fact that they were putting some stitches in or whatever, and I found it a lot easier. I didn't feel it painless but I found it a lot easier. And eventually I got to the point where I'm nuts. Um, they had to stitch back uh, just a small um, hole in the stomach where there'd been a big tube. And I said to him, can you please do that without anaesthetic? And that wasn't trying to be macho. That wasn't trying to show off to him. That was, see if I could take that. You know, if I can take that, you know, what chance does cancer have? You know, I can do all these things that cancer would normally, would normally throw me. You know, so, you know, it might be warped logic, ladies and gentlemen, and many of you will not want to try that, but <laughs> there, was, there was method to my madness in my mind anyway. And when back in the real world, I uh, went through a long period where I so sought out every thrill-seeking activity. So, you know, just putting it up front, as I say there, I'm petrified of heights. If you put me on a ledge, that's it. I'm not going to go anywhere. I might fall off through shaking, but that's about it. I couldn't, you know, couldn't do that. But So I threw myself into situations that scared the living daylights out of me sometimes, um, or at least uh, made me, you know, apprehensive. And that included going up in many, many aeroplanes and doing aerobatics, you know, as a, as a passenger, um, bungee jumping many times, um, you know, on and on and on and on and on. Uh, just about anything I could find, gliders, you know, on and on. Um, I took work promotions that I didn't ex especially think I was prepared for. If they had offered me these jobs, there were such certain situations that lined themselves up in the mid-90s, I think it was, uh, where, you know, um, I was kind of the last cab on the rank in terms of senior person. I would never have taken the job because I felt it would have thrown my balance out of whack in terms of my whole life, but I did. I said, you know, anything they said, would you like to try? I'll say, yep, yeah, okay. Now, it meant a little bit more money, but actually on the other side of the coin, it lost me a lot of life balance. But it was also, again, you know, there is no negative experience the result of that was I understood better and better what I didn't want to do just as much as I understood what I did want to do. I signed up to extramural study. I had done no, you know, I left school uh, age six, 16, 17 uh, with UE, uh, if anyone remembers that, and, uh, and I didn't go to the varsity. It was full employment back then. There was 1623, I think it was. And, uh, and, you know, I just went into a job. So I'd never, you know, and I climbed through um, in terms of the jobs I was doing, but I never had any tertiary qualifications. And I was also a very, very average student at school because I wasn't focused. Well, I didn't know why. I thought maybe I just I was sick. But I wasn't focused. I didn't know what I was aiming for. It seemed pointless to me, et cetera. And what I found out about myself was, you know, whatever I do needs to have purpose. It needs to have some kind of purpose, right? I'm not going to do it or I'm going to do it real bad. And so... Um, you know, I did these qualifications and I ended up passing them with distinction to my surprise and all the rest of it. But again, those qualifications, in terms of what I want to do with my life, I don't know if they're going to help me very much at all. But the actual testing of myself and the actual achievement that I, that I got uh, enables me to have more self-confidence and, uh, and better self-image. And oh, here we go, here we go. Um, I got a tattoo. At age 34, no, it didn't say mother, no, it doesn't love hate on the knuckles or anything like that. But I had that, uh, and I think that was actually just after I'd had my radiotherapy on my neck. I can see you smirking. I can see that smirk. Uh, 